Good morning, Vertical Church. Welcome to another Sunday morning online where we're going to be together in God's Word. Before we get God's Word open, I want to encourage you to um, grab your phones, head over to verticalcharleston.org forward slash live. And on that page, you'll find three ways to connect with us and to be a part of our service here today. The first way that you can do that is through our register. Click on that link that says register and then let us know that you were here. Let us know if we can serve you in any way. Let us know how we can pray for you. Once you've done that, then we would love for you to worship the Lord through your giving. Thanks for being faithful on that. We've made it easy for you. Just click on that button. It'll take you to our website where you can make an offering to the Lord as you worship through giving. And the final thing that I'll draw your attention to on that page is the virtual visits. So thankful for those of you who have signed up for virtual visits and allowed us to connect that way. And if you'd like to connect and um, just talk or meet together uh, through a Zoom meeting, then you can do that by clicking on the virtual visit button. It'll bring up my calendar and you can sign up a time for us to meet together. And I would love the privilege and the opportunity to do that with you. That's been super, super encouraging for me with those people who have done that. So thanks for doing that. All right. I want to encourage you to grab your copy of God's Word and make your way over to the book of Ephesians. Get over to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through God's Word. Now, in preparation for this sermon, I was doing some research on the amount of words spoken every day, both by men and by women. And like me, you probably have heard the statistic that who um, speaks more than the other? Do the women speak more or do the men speak more? <laughs> the statistic that I always heard before I researched it this week was that women speak three times more words a day than the average man speaks. But I did some research and I found out that that's not actually true at all. In fact, what the researchers have discovered is, is that women speak a total of about 16,200 words a day and men on average speak about 15,900. Uh, both of those round to, off to about 16,000 words a day, which for some of you that's way high, for others of you that's way low. Um, if it's Sunday for me, that apparently seems to be way high. But what the research showed was that um, on average, uh, people are speaking a lot of words every single day. And with those words that are being spoken, um, there's a lot of opportunity for you and me every single day. And you may be thinking, opportunity? What do you mean opportunity? Well, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 tells us the kind of opportunity that there is in the words that we speak. Uh, Proverbs 18, 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. In other words, with every word that we speak, we can either produce good things like life, we produce life in people, or we can produce bad things like death when we produce them. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to kill them with our words, but it's talking about like killing their emotions and their mind and their attitude. It's like destroying them instead of building them up and helping them grow. See, with every word that we speak, we have an opportunity to affect the people who are listening to our words one way or the other. The words that we use matter. And with so many words being spoken, we need the instruction in our text here in Ephesians 4 this morning. And if we're going to preserve the unity of the body, if we're going to be diligent to keep uh, the unity of the spirit that we already have in Christ and make an impact on the world around us, then we're going to have to come to a place this morning where we understand that our words count. The words that we say matter, and God is very specific about the instructions that He gives to us with the kind of words that should be coming out of our mouth, Christian. So our text this morning is Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to spend all of our time in verse 29. The title of the sermon is just this, Words count. And I think you'll see it very clearly in the text. I hope you made your way over to Ephesians 4. You're there with me. It'll be on the bottom of the screen for you. If you don't have a Bible, but if you do have a Bible, I always encourage you to have a, a copy of God's Word in your hand, just like this, and look at God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 20. This is the Word of the Lord. But you did not learn Christ in this way, 
if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so he will have something to share with the one who has need." Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. All right. Well, let's pray together. We're going to ask God to teach us, and then we're going to um, study this passage together. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Though we're separated by distance, we're together in your spirit. And I thank you for the gift of hearing your word taught and proclaimed, and that we get to hold your word in our hands and see your word with our own eyes. God, I'm asking this morning that in the power of your spirit, you would speak that you would speak to all those who are watching the sermon and who are listening to the podcast, and that you would use your words to bring about the desired change in each of our lives. God, we don't want to be the same. We don't want to just be hearers of your word. We want to be doers of your word. And every single one of us struggle with the words that we are speaking out of our mouths. So God, would you please bring conviction and correction and instruction and encouragement this morning from your word and change our hearts and minds so that we would leave your word saying, yes, Lord, may it be true of me. Father, we ask that you would do all of these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, here's the main idea. The main idea is this. Because life and death are in the power of the tongue, I will use my words to build up others. I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Christ. And because I know that life and death are in the power of my tongue, that words matter, the words count, what I'm saying makes a difference one way or the other. And because I know all of those things are true, then I want to use my words to build up others. In this section in Ephesians 4, you'll remember with me that we've been learning about our new life in Christ and that in Christ we have these new ways of living that are in direct contradiction. They're distinct from the ways that we used to live before we came to Jesus Christ. For the past couple of weeks, we've learned that in my old life, I used to use lying as a coping mechanism and a way to get by. But in Christ, that's not an option for me anymore. I've laid aside falsehood and now I'm just going to speak speak truth in love with each other. And that instead of going around and living in unrighteous anger, that what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk with a righteous attitude and righteous actions. Yes, there are things that I should be angry about, but it's just a very small number of things, God's glory and people being hurt. Most of the things that I'm angry about, I should just be letting go and giving those things to God and trusting him with those things. And I want to deal with my anger in a biblical way so that I can walk in righteousness, both in my heart and in my actions. And then last week we learned that God has not called us to be takers. Yes, there are appropriate seasons in our life where we're supposed to receive, but we're supposed to primarily be known for our giving because we serve a God who is a giver. And so we're supposed to be givers. And when we give, we put God's glory on display and they see God's generosity. And we want to be people who Instead of like our old life where we were takers and our new life, we become those people who are growing day by day in our generosity. Now, if we're going to continue to preserve the unity of the Spirit, and if we're going to make an impact for Christ in this world, we have got to get our mouths under control. James talks about the trouble that we have in doing this in James chapter 3 beginning in verse 5 where James says this, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. 
and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the image or in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. James recognizes the struggle that you and I know all too familiar that we just can't seem to get our words under control. But yet when a person comes to Christ, our text is going to tell us very clearly that our words must be under the control of the Spirit of God and that we're only supposed to be speaking certain kinds of words for the people around us. This admonition that James is giving us is found all over God's Word, and it's the same admonition that Paul is giving to the church at Ephesus. He wants them to master their tongues so that they can remain united and make an impact in the world for Christ. It's what he wanted for them, and it's what he wants for us. Now, here's the point. Your words are making an impact. They are. They're making an impact. Everything you say, every interaction you have, you're making an impact with your words. It's not a question of if you're making an impact, is it? The, the real question is, what kind of impact are you making with the words that you're using? And so Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he writes to us, and he says this in verse 29. Look at the text. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Well, the first instruction that he gives us, if we're going to honor God with our mouths, if we're going to make an impact in the world for Christ, is this. Don't say what tears down. I mean, it's just simple instruction. Do you see it there in verse 29? Let no unwholesome word Proceed from your mouth. Don't say what tears other people down. Followers of Jesus Christ cannot use their words to tear people down. And if you're thinking of a situation, and in that situation you think that it's your responsibility to destroy a person and to knock them down and to tear them down with your words, verse 29 is specifically prohibiting that. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But when you do a word study on that word unwholesome, it gets even clearer. It gets more graphic. That word unwholesome means rotten. It means putrid or filthy. It's the word that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 7 when he was using um, the word to describe rotten fruit. Now, I, I like fruit, and there's hardly a fruit that I don't like, um, but I don't like rotten fruit. I don't like the way it smells. I don't like the way it tastes. And in fact, I don't want to eat it. And if I know that it's rotten, I won't eat it. I don't want to be around it. It's just, it's, it's terrible. Um, it's also the word that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 12 to refer to rotten fish. Now, we lived in the Keys for a little while, and in the Keys, um, being around fish all of the time, you knew that when you got done fishing, one of the things that you had to do was to clean the boat and clean all of your gear well. And if you forgot to do that, then it would leave the smell of rotting fish. And if you've ever been around rotting fish, it doesn't just like smell right where the fish is, like it just penetrates the whole area area and spreads everywhere else. It's a pretty strong picture being used to describe the kind of words that are prohibited from coming out of our mouth. See, here's the thing about rotten fruit and rotten fish. They don't, they don't nourish you. In fact, if you eat them, they'll make you sick. Furthermore, they stink up everything in the vicinity. That's what also unwholesome words are. They're rotten, putrid words that tear people down and stink up the whole place. The question that I want to know is, do you use those kinds of words? 
do you use rotten words? Do you use unwholesome words? To which you would say, well, well what, what are rotten words? What are unwholesome words? What are we really talking about here? Well, I'm glad you asked. I was studying the, the scriptures this week and I found 10 unwholesome or rotten words that tear down that Christians should not be using. They're going to come at you pretty quickly. And then I'm also going to give you a scripture reference for a, one of the places that scripture talks about where this is prohibited or counseled against for Christians. Here's the first one, 10 words that tear down. Number one, gossip. Gossip. Gossip tears people down. The word gossip literally means to whisper. But in the New Testament, it's only used in a bad sense of sharing derogatory information about someone, and it's offered in this tone of confidentiality. It's quietly going around and whispering and talking about somebody, and it's trying to bring people around to the really negative, terrible opinion that I have about somebody else. And I don't want everybody to hear me saying it. I just want you to hear it. And I want you to think about this person the way that I think about them. That kind of talking is always prohibited in the Christian life. And if you're talking about people in a negative way so that other people think negative about them, you're gossiping. And that's prohibited for the Christian. Proverbs uh, chapter 11 verse 9 speaks about this when it says, With his mouth the godless man destroys his neighbor. He tears him down. It's a godless man. That's not what God's people do. The godless man does that. I mean, reading Romans chapter 1 in the verse that talks about uh, God turning people over because of the hardness of their heart. One of the sins that is listed as a result of God turning people over and the hardness of their heart is actually gossip. Gossip is indicative of a heart that is hardened towards God. It's not a heart that loves people. It's not a heart that loves God. Christian, let no gossip proceed from your mouth. It's unwholesome, rotten, filthy talk that has no place in your life. That's the first thing. The second thing is closely related to gossip, and that's slander. Slander is where gossip is the secret whispering so that people think negatively about somebody. Slander is the open talking about broadcasting to everybody. It's not just enough that one person thinks this way. I want everybody to think this way about how terrible this person is where gossip is whispering slander is just loud mouthing to everybody about that person and the word for slander in the Greek is actually a word that's used to describe the devil and it's not used to describe God's people it's not supposed to be a part of the words that we use and how we act listen to this warning given in Psalm 101 verse 5 Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. And by secretly, he means his neighbor doesn't know about it, but it's not a secret. Everybody else knows about it. And God says, whoever slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. I mean, God just warns us and says, this cannot be true of my people. Christian, let slander not proceed from your mouth. Third, these are all words that tear down. Insults. Using your words to, dare, to tear down someone by saying hurtful and insensitive and painful things that just injure. And most often when we see that it's injured somebody, we try to cover it by saying, well, I was just joking. Or, come on, can't you take a joke? Why are you taking things so personal? And we just use our words to injure and to insult and say offensive things. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 prohibits this for the Christian and says that we're not supposed to return evil for evil or insult for insult. Even if somebody is insulting us, we're not given permission to insult them. It's prohibited for us. Instead, we're supposed to be giving a blessing for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Christian, let no insult proceed from your mouth. Fourthly, complaining. Complaining is prohibited in James chapter 5, verse 9. 
which says, do not complain, brethren. I mean, that's pretty simple and clear, isn't it? Do not complain. Then he goes on to say specifically, don't complain against one another. I shouldn't be complaining about you. You shouldn't be complaining about me. You shouldn't be complaining about your small group leader. And you shouldn't be complaining about your pastor's wife and your pastor's children and the people in your small group. We should not be complaining about one another. It never should happen, and it certainly shouldn't happen in the world. I and mean, what a terrible testimony for God's glory and for the fame of Jesus Christ that we're complaining about each other to the world around us. It is rotten, filthy speech. No wonder nobody wants to come to your church. No wonder nobody wants to come to Christ complaining about each other all the time. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Christian, let no complaining proceed from your mouth. Fifthly, unrighteous anger. Unrighteous anger tears people down. We just did a whole sermon on this. You can go back to our website and find this message. I'm not going to re-preach that message, but I will just say this. Not only does Ephesians 4 say in verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. James chapter 1 verse 20 tells us that the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce God's righteousness. It doesn't produce what God wants. And your unrighteous anger is not building people up. It's tearing them down and it is prohibited for the Christian. Christian, let no unrighteous angry words proceed from your mouth. Number six, the kind of words that destroy people is destructive criticism. Destructive criticism is that kind of criticism that is always or usually masquerading as like helpful, positive feedback or constructive criticism, but the words really just criticize in an unhelpful way. The goal is not really to help that person. The goal is to make that person look bad and to make that person feel bad and somehow in a weird, twisted way to make you feel better by making that person person feel bad. The goal is, is to hurt and to injure with our criticisms. James chapter 4 verse 11 says, do not speak against one another, brethren. We should not be criticizing each other. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 that we're not supposed to judge each other. And by judge, he means we're not supposed to be critically condemning and criticizing each other. It's a harsh, condemning criticism about each other. Christian, let no destructive criticism proceed from your mouth. Another way that we use words to tear down is when we use lies or falsehood, when we just don't speak the truth and we deceive people. That tears people down. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 says, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Another message on our website we did about this. Um, you can't lie to people and not tear them down. When you lie to a person, you're hurting them, you're injuring them, and you think that you're protecting them, but you're not. You're, you're hurting them and you're destroying the unity of the body. And the scriptures say uh, that we cannot be people who speak falsehood. Christian, let no falsehood proceed from your mouth. The eighth way that we tear down with our words is with unrighteous arguments. Well, sure, there are things that we should have discussions about, and sometimes those can be even intense discussions. But what I'm talking about here is, is when we just like to argue for argument's sake. We, we just enjoy quarreling. We're the argumentative one. And anytime anybody has anything to say, we immediately disagree with it, and we want to get into a debate, and we want to argue, and we are just known for quarreling. And so many Christians are known this way in their workplace. If their boss comes to them with instruction, they know that immediately they're going to get pushed back immediately it's going to be an argument. Some husbands are this way and wives don't bring anything to their husbands because everything's an argument or husbands aren't saying things to their wives or kids aren't talking to their parents because we just like to argue and we care more about being right and winning than we care about loving God and loving people. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 says, Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about 
words. We shouldn't be getting into these unrighteous arguments that are frivolous and don't produce anything but only hurt people and tear them down. It's useless and it leads to the ruin of the hearers. Christian, let no unrighteous arguments proceed from your mouth. The ninth way that you and I tear down with our words is by blaming blaming. The scripture reference that I would give this for you is in Genesis chapter 3, what God gives the command for Adam and Eve to eat from any tree in the garden, um, but one tree they weren't allowed to eat from, and we know how that goes. They decide to eat, and when they eat, God comes and asks Adam what happened to him, and the first thing that Adam says is, the woman gave me the fruit, and I ate it, and, and when God says to Eve, what did you do? She says, the serpent deceived me, and I ate of it. Blaming, blaming. We see it first in the fall in the Garden of Eden, and we see it most often in our lives with superlatives. In conversations that we have with people in discipleship, or I've sometimes sadly in my own life do this, you always do this, or you never. And we're just blaming and we're tearing people down when we say that because the reality is nobody always does anything. And nobody never does anything. Those words are unhelpful and you're just blaming a person and it's, a, it's an attack on that person and on their character and that's why they're so offended when you're saying it and Christians shouldn't be blaming and attacking each other in that way. Those words tear down and they destroy Christian. Let no blaming come from your mouth. And then this tenth and final thing that I wrote down, filthy talk. Filthy talk tears people down. It destroys them. It doesn't build them up. When you say, well, what's filthy talk? Well, we're going to do a whole sermon on this when we get over to chapter 5. But filthy talk is sexual innuendo. It's dirty jokes. It's taking what is sacred and special and making it vulgar. And you should not be known uh, certainly as a person who is saying those things, but you shouldn't even be a part of a conversation where there's, those things are readily accepted and through your awkward chuckle or through your presence, you're somehow giving approval to what's happening there. It's not supposed to be a part of our life. It should not be coming out of our mouths. Christian, let no filthy talk proceed from your mouth because Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. Again, we'll deal with that when we get into chapter 5. But like these things have no place in your life. And Christian, those are 10 things that I found in Scripture, but there are more. And you can probably think of more. But these things have no place in our life. And, and I don't know how to make the point any clearer, but except to say to you that God's word is saying over and over and over again, God cares very much about the words that we're using, and we can't say words that tear people down. Don't say what tears people down. If it destroys, it tears down, and I'm not supposed to say it. And you say, why? Why can't I say it? Like I can think of many situations where I think that that's the right response and they just need to hear it. Listen, first of all, not only is it sin to talk that way, but even more than that, and in addition to that, not only is it sin, but what God is doing in the life of every single follower of Jesus Christ is he's building them up. He has taken them from dead and he's made them alive. And now he's block by block, step by step, building them and conforming them to the image of Christ. And every single follower of Jesus Christ is in the process of being built up by God. And when you come along with your unwholesome, rotten words, you are acting in a way that is contrary to what God wants to do in their life. You're setting yourself up on the opposite team of God in the work that he wants to do in somebody's life. Now, how do you think that that's going to go? Do you have any chance of winning and defeating? That's a really bad plan to set yourself up opposite of what God is doing. And yet so many of us are working contrary to God. 
who is building up every single follower of Jesus Christ. He's transforming them and he's changing them and he's molding them and he's shaping them and just block by block and thing by thing, he's making them into the very image of Jesus Christ. And when we speak words that tear down, we're trying to work against God. See, here's the incredible thing. God is inviting us to get involved in the work that he is doing in the lives of the people that he has placed around us and get involved in the work of building those people up. Look at verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. Only only, underline the word only in your Bible. These are the only kind of words that are supposed to be coming out of the mouth of the Christian. Only speak a word as is good for edification. Only speak a word that's good for edification. That word edification means building up. It's used in this passage in a metaphorical sense to refer to um, the process of building something and it's in its distinction from like the completed structure. In other words, it's not in doubt about whether or not the thing's going to be built, but we're in a process right now and we're building the thing part by part. In other words, what this verse is saying is, is that every single Christian has a sign hanging over their head that says, work in progress. Did you know that? Did you know that every single Christian is a work in progress? I mean, you already knew that about me, right? You're like, man, you've got a lot of work left to do, right? But you should see how far we've come. God's done a lot of work already, and there's still a long way to go. I'm a work in progress, and so are you. And none of us are the finished, final, full and complete product. God's in the process of changing all of us. And now he's saying to us as a church, hey, I'm in this process with other Christians. I want you to get involved, and I want you to be a part of them growing up and being all that I want them to be in my son. And with our words, we can either join God in piece by piece building that person up to maturity in Christ, or we can piece by piece tear them down. And a question that I should be asking before I open my mouth is I should be asking the question of, will this build the person up? Because if it won't build them up, then we've already established that I can't say it. But if it will build them up, then that's the kind of thing that I'm supposed to be saying. You say, well, how do I know if it will build them up? Well, verse 29 gives us two requirements. Look at it. Only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment. There's the first thing. And here's the second thing so that it will give grace to those who hear. The first thing is, how do I know if it's going to build them up? Well, it's according to the need of the moment. And what that's implying is, is that I actually know what the need of the moment is. Now, how am I supposed to discern and understand what the need of the moment is with you as I'm talking with you? What's being implied here is, is that I'm listening. I'm listening for understanding. I'm not listening just so that I can get my words in and now it's my turn to talk, but I'm listening so I can understand the situation. I know where you are. I know what's happened. I know how you've gotten where you are. I'm entering into what you're saying so that I know what the actual need of the moment is. And what it's saying to us is, is that it's not a one size fits all for every single situation. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time for everything and there's a right time to say the right thing in the right way. And if you're one of those Christians who just thinks that the way to fix everything is to just slap a scripture verse on every single thing that everybody is facing, you're destroying a lot of people with God's word instead of helping them. Now, I'm not saying that God's word isn't the answer to every single thing that we're facing. It is, but it's God's word rightly applied, the right thing at the right time, at the right situation, and that God gives you wisdom to know when you just need to be quiet and listen and practice the ministry of presence and mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. And then when it's time to do what else needs to be done, you need to know where that person is, you need to know the need of the moment. That's why James chapter 1 verse 19 says that everyone must be quick to hear 
and slow to speak. We get that backwards, don't we? We're so quick to speak. Sometimes we do that because it's just awkward and we don't know what to say and we're trying to make it better, but we can do more damage with our words than we can when we should just be quick to hear, ready to hear and ready to enter in and slow to speak. We should listen to understand. We should ask questions to clarify, to make sure that we understand. And once that's happened, then we can speak according to the need of the moment. Proverbs 18, 13 says that he who gives an answer before he hears, got an answer before you even know what's going on, it says it is folly and it's a shame to him. So if, if I'm going to build a person up, first I've got to listen. I've got to hear what's happening. I've got to understand. I should be praying and asking the Lord for wisdom to understand what's happening. And once I know the need of the moment, then verse 29 says, I've got to make sure that it's going to give grace to those who hear. That word grace could also be translated as the word help. The thing that I say should help the person. This is a really great balance for speaking the truth. A couple of weeks ago, we said that a Christian can't lie. A Christian has to speak the truth. And sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that we just have to speak the truth in a way that destroys people. And you're just going to have to hear the way that I speak the truth. And it's the truth. You know, the truth is, is that you're all terrible people. That's the truth. And you just need to hear it. And you don't care for me. And you don't love me. And I like that's being prohibited. It's prohibited in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, which says we're supposed to speak the truth in love. But it's also prohibited here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, which says that the words that I speak are supposed to give grace or help to those who hear. And when you unload on everybody, you're not helping them. And you think that you can do it because you're speaking the truth. Speaking your truth is dumb doesn't exist. There's only truth and error. Okay. It's not objective. It's sub, it's not subjective. It's objective. There's the truth. And when we communicate the truth, we're supposed to do it in such a way that helps the person. And you should ask the question, is this the most helpful thing that I can say right now? And if it is the most helpful thing, then you should be ready to move forward and to help build that person up. See, the awesome thing being conveyed here is that God wants you and me, Christian, to help extend grace to the hearer of our words. That every interaction we have with somebody, we should see it as an opportunity to build them up piece by piece, to see them conformed into who God wants them to be. That God wants to use our words to speak life into each other. I was thinking about this this week, about God and His words. And I was thinking about the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 1, uh, God stepped into nothing and He spoke words. And His words created everything. He, God said, let there be light. And there was. And God created everything with words. God's words produce life. That's the God that we serve. And He hasn't changed in the way that He's still operating in people's lives. And what he wants to do, Christian, is he says, I want you to be an image bearer of mine. I, I want you to use words that speak life into people and that builds them up. Not words that destroy, not words that tear down, but words that build up and words that conform and bring a person to maturity in Christ. God is inviting us to use our words the way that he used them in creating life. Now, there's lots of ways to do this, and I have another list for you now. Ten quick things about words, ten words that build up. Here's the first one, biblical verses to go with these as well. The first way that we can build people up with our words is just with encouragement or with praise. Um, by finding something that the person is doing good and encouraging them and coming alongside of them. Sometimes they may be down or sometimes you may have seen them do something good and you want to come alongside of them and help lift their spirits and encourage them and, and be the one to help them take the next step or you want to give them praise for the right thing that they're doing. Maybe they're discouraged and you come along 
alongside of them and you have words to say to them that help them get going again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. And the words that I'm speaking, I, I need to be speaking encouraging words that lift the person up and build them up. And, and some of us just need to train ourselves to start looking for these things in people so that we can praise them and build them up. Secondly, a second way to build with our words is by giving gratitude or just giving thanks. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. And be thankful. We should just be saying thank you to each other all of the time. This is one of the things that makes Chick-fil-A so great. That when you go to them and you just express gratitude to them and you say thank you, they don't just say um, nothing or let you drive on. But when you say to Chick-fil-A, uh, thank you, what do they say? They say, my pleasure. It's one of the things that Chick-fil-A does so well. One of, our, one of our friends posted on Facebook this past week that they went to Chick-fil-A and how disappointed they were that they said thank you to the person who was serving them and they didn't get a my pleasure. There's just something about expressing gratitude to each other and for each other that builds up and that encourages each other. We need more of that to build each other up. The third way we can build with our words is by forgiveness. Now we're going to do a whole sermon on this next week in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. We can extend forgiveness to each other and by forgiving each other we build each other up. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Sometimes the best way that we can build somebody up with our words is by saying the words, I forgive you. And when somebody comes to you and they confess their sin to you and they say, I've sinned against you and what I did was wrong, please forgive me. Don't let the next words out of your mouth be, it's okay or don't worry about it. They said, will you please forgive me? And you can build them. You have an opportunity to join God in the work that he's doing by saying to them, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then when they continue to bring it up, tell them, no, no, I, I've forgiven you. We've drawn a line in the sand. We're not going back to that. I forgive you. That will build people up. The fourth way we can build each other up with our words is just by giving instruction to each other, by giving instruction. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. So see that first part? The word of Christ is richly dwelling in me. And then when it's richly dwelling in me, then with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. See, I'm supposed to be instructing you. You're supposed to be instructing me. This is what we're supposed to be doing in our small groups. The lamest, worst experience in small group when one guy in small group is doing what I'm doing right now and doing all the talking. Small group is supposed to be we're admonishing each other. We're teaching each other. We're instructing each other. We're building up each other in that way teaching and admonishing one another. We do that with instruction. Words of instructions build up. Fifthly, words of warning. Words of warning can also build up. And I can think of many examples in my life from my wife and from other people who have cautioned me and come at the right time, in the right way, with a word of warning that has caused me to reconsider what I was doing and, and to go in a different course James chapter 5 verse 19 talks about this when James says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Sometimes we build each other up by giving words of warning and don't do that and don't go that way. That's going to lead to destruction. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Please stop doing that. Words of warning are words that can even build up the right word at the right time in the right way. And here's the sixth way, confession. Confessing our sins to one another. Do you know that the scriptures teach that when we confess our sins to one another, that it produces something good, not only in my life, but in your life? James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And what this verse is trying to communicate is that in some way, when I'm confessing my sins to you, 
that that has some sort of a healing effect in my soul, in my heart, in my mind. It builds me up to be able to confess my sins to you. And likewise, when you confess your sins to me, God also uses that to build me up and to help me. It's mutual ministry at its best. This is why hiding and lying are so destructive to the unity of the body. They don't build up, they tear down, but confession of sin and openness and honesty bring about a healing in our lives and they build us up block by block. Here's the seventh way we can build with our words, by expressing care and concern, by expressing care and concern for each other. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. That as your brother in Christ, I have a responsibility to know and share in your burdens so that I can come up underneath them with you side by side and help and shoulder that burden with you. And sometimes we just need to express to people our words of care and our words of concern. I want you to know that I see what's happening and I want you to know that I care for you. One of the best ways that we can express words of care and concern is not only by saying that, but by praying with and for each other. I see what you're going through and I want to pray for you right now. Or to, to send a text and to let a person know. So many texts I've gotten in the past couple of weeks have done this very thing. Joe, I want you to know that I'm praying for you today and here's how I'm praying for you. Are there other ways that I could pray for you? And I want you guys to know how much that encourages me and how special that is to me. And let's do that in each other's lives. Thank you so much for the way that you guys are doing that. Here's the eighth way we can build each other with our words. We can bless each other. We can give a blessing. We can ask the Lord's blessing in someone's life. And we can either do that with them face to face or we can do it through a prayer. I was thinking of the blessing in Numbers chapter 6, verses tw beginning on verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. It's speaking God's blessing over this person and asking God to do awesome things in this person's life. That will build a person up. That will give a person faith and confidence. And it's one more block every time you do that in the person that God is making. The ninth way that we can do that is by using loving words, by communicating our unconditional commitment to each other in Christ. Not just communicating emotion, but communicating our unconditional commitment to you. Listen, I love you and nothing you do can change that. I've made a decision to act in your best interest, whether you want it to receive it or not. Whether you turn from it or not, I can't control that. But I've made a decision to act in your best interest and to care about you and for you. Romans chapter 13 verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Here's the 10th way that we can build each other up with our words. We can honor each other. We can honor each other. To honor someone is to treat them with respect and admiration. It's to publicly show respect and admiration for them with your words. And, and listen, I just want you to know what, what Dawn has done. And I want you to know um, how much she deserves our admiration and respect for what she has done. It's, it's using our words to publicly lift somebody up and admire them. Romans chapter 13 verse 7 says, Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to who custom, fear to whom fear. And then notice this, honor to whom honor. Render honor to whom honor is due. There's lots of other ways. There are lots of ways to build up with our words. And if you're stuck saying words, it seems like always the words that are coming out of your mouth are tearing people down. Listen, this is how you fix that. It's not just by keeping your mouth shut. Yes, it is being quick to listen, quick to hear and slow to speak. But it's actually then opening your mouth according to the deed of the moment so that it will help the person and then speaking words that build them up. And if you'll spend all your time speaking words that build people up, then what you're going to be doing is, is you're going to be joining God in the work that he's doing in the life of that Christian, building that person up. And God is saying to us this morning, Vertical Church, I want to use you to build up the body of Jesus Christ, and I want to use your words to do it. He's saying to you, wives, I want to use your words to build up your husband. 
Husbands, he's saying, I want to use your words to build up your wife and to build up your children and to build up your bosses and your neighbors and your co-workers and everybody in your small group. God wants to use your words to build people up. And your words count and your words matter. And in your words are life and death. What kind of words are you speaking? And would you hear the clear call from God this morning to come out from a life that speaks unwholesome words that just tear people down? Christian, let's be done with that. And let's displace that by putting on a new lifestyle that speaks words that encourage and that build up and that edify and that join God in the work that he is doing. And if we're, we will be people who let no unwholesome word proceed from our mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it gives grace, that it gives help to the person who is hearing us, we are going to have a huge impact for God's kingdom. Now we Finish with James' admonition, right, from James chapter 3. Who can tame the tongue? Who can tame the tongue? I've got plenty of practice to know that I can't tame it, and you have plenty of practice to know that you can't tame it either, but you know who can tame it? God can tame it. And in His Spirit, He can overcome your tongue if you'll submit to His Spirit and say, Lord, help me to control my mouth and to only speak words that build up. Why don't we pray right now and ask God for help in that? Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help and not only understanding what this verse is teaching, but actually doing it and applying it to our lives. So God, I pray that for all the people of Vertical Church and all the people who are listening to this sermon, that we would be known as people who speak words that build others up, that when people leave conversations from us, that they are replenished and that they are filled and that they are encouraged and that they want more conversation and that, God, you would use that to give us an opportunity to speak about the gospel. So God, I pray that you would change our hearts and our minds. I pray that we would repent in the areas where we are letting unwholesome words proceed from our mouth and that we would again come to you, Lord, and say, God, please help us and speak through us words that build life. God, we need you to do this in us and through us. And we ask that you would do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of quick announcements for you. Student ministries are meeting tonight. Our student ministries are meeting in Zoom. And if you've got high school and middle school students, we'd love to get them connected into one of those groups so that they can be discipled and learning how to live for Christ. Just let us know on your register that you want to get connected and we'll get you connected in that way. Small groups are on this week and I've got a great announcement about small groups. Um, our small groups are meeting right now through Zoom meetings and they will continue that way for the next two weeks. But beginning the week of June 6th, Seventh, we are going to begin meeting in homes again. The week of June 7th begins our in-home meetings of small group again. So thank you for being so patient and thank you for um, bearing with us and working hard to love each other during this time. It's time now for the church to begin steps to coming back together and carrying out the commands that Almighty God has given us. Can't wait to get back together in small groups. If you're not connected to a small group, let us know on your register. We'd love to get you in a small group. Well, glad that you were here this morning, church. It's time to go out and to realize that our words matter and that our words count and to go around speaking words of life to the world around us. Have a great day. Glad that you were here. You are loved.